Hmm? This is our notes on forcings and feedbacks. Um, okay, so forcings are something that directly change the climate. So it's kind of like uh, poking your little brother and making them squeal, right? That's a forcing. Feedback is the effect of the forcing that causes something else to happen. Your little brother smacks you and gets in trouble for hitting. Um, so um, feedbacks can cause something else to happen. Um, positive feedbacks are ones that are like a self-reinforcing cycle. So like if uh, you're nervous about doing well on a test, so you procrastinate studying, so then you do poorly on the test, and then you start to worry about the next one. That's a self-reinforcing cycle. Um, and negative feedbacks stop the effects of a forcing. So it works like a thermostat. If it's too hot in your house uh, or too cold in your house, the, um, the furnace will kick on. Um, it'll warm your house up, and then once your house is warm enough, it will turn that off. And so um, the thing about a forcing is that it can lead to feedbacks, and then those feedbacks can either enhance or stop forcing. And then this enhance has a positive after it, and stop has a negative after it, because forcing the, feed, the feedbacks, if it's positive, doesn't always heat the atmosphere or cool the atmosphere. Same thing with negative. It's more about how the feedback relates to each other. Um, so we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, some example forcings that we want you to know about are greenhouse gases. Um, we talked about that a little bit last week. Um, because they absorb more of the incoming radiation, and radiation is another one, um, which is how much energy is actually coming in from the sun. And so there's lots of things that can make that change. Sunspots, which is this upper right-hand image, or this yellow line here, um, are one of them. And so the more sunspots there are, the more solar radiation we have, and that goes through about an 11-year cycle. Um, that's the important piece of this little tiny graph right here is that yellow line, that solar activity we see is declining, but our temperature is still increasing. So uh, we know it's not the energy coming in from the sun, but it also includes these Milankovitch cycles. It's how eccentric our orbit is, which that's really extreme. Um, obliquity is how much we're tilted, and precession is how much we spin, we wobble in our tilt. Um, and so um, other things can be like the amount of uh, water vapor and clouds and ice. Um, so the albedo of the, of the planet can also impact the amount of radiation, right? So how much gets reflected. But albedo itself is a, is a feedback, so we'll talk more about that here in a second. Another first thing that we have is the El Niño-La Niña cycles. The ocean acts like this huge heat energy pump. It moves heat energy from the equatorial region up to uh, or up and down to the poles, and it does that through both surface and deep currents. And um, El Nino and La Nina are specific cycles of those currents. And what we've discovered is it slows that ocean heat pump down. It doesn't move the heat energy around as much. And so when we're in one of those cycles, and you can see how much um, that uh, changes over time. Um, we've had El Nino events are the up ones and La Nina events are the down ones. Um, it can change local like weather patterns. Um, for example, we can get more tornadoes or more flooding or whatever here in the Midwest. Um, but it slows, the important part is it slows that ocean, because it's changing the surface temperatures, it slows that ocean heat pump down. So the heat doesn't get redistributed around the planet as easily. Um, and then the last one you need to know about are aerosols. Aerosols are pollution that is in our atmosphere. Um, it can either reflect and scatter light and cause some cooling, or it can be soot that darkens ice and snow and changes our albedo. Um, both, whether it's um, pollution that scatters the light, those are both impacting the albedo of the planet. And again, that is a feedback. Um, and so reminder that albedo is how much light is reflected. Um, so you can almost use those interchangeably. The thing is albedo talks about color. So if it's high albedo, you get lots of light reflected. If it's low albedo, you get lots of light absorbed. Um, and so if we have black carbon soot from like the industrial revolution from burning coal, you get a low albedo and it will cause warming. But another example are volcanoes. Volcanoes can spew the sulfur dioxide up into the upper atmosphere um, where they will act like little tiny mirrors. So these aerosols can act like little tiny mirrors and it can cool the planet. Um, so an example we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a picture of here is Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. Um, and this caused a half a degree of cooling. And which is important because when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about three degrees Celsius. So half a degree is pretty significant. 
So in this first left image, we see um, before the eruption um, what kind of uh, how many aerosols we had in the in the planet, and we don't really see much. It's all blue. And then the next image we see right after the eruption, we can see this big red band kind of along the equator. And so that was um, right after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. And then we see over time how those disperse. And so that caused a half a degree of cooling. Um, so volcanoes, while they also spew uh, gases that can be greenhouse gases, also can cause cooling in terms of global climate. Um, so those are some examples of forcings. Some examples of feedbacks are albedo. So I'm, you've heard me mention that twice. Um, and so what we have with albedo, when we're talking about albedo and feedbacks, um, we have to think about, when we're talking about feedbacks, we have to start to think about how these things are starting to relate. So we've talked about radiation and Earth's energy, and we've talked about forcings. Now, how do those pieces fit together? So we're going to start with albedo. <clears throat> and again, high albedo is more reflection, lighter color. Uh, low albedo is less reflection, darker color. So ice has a really high albedo, so anything with ice and snow. Um, water and land have a really low albedo. Um, so if we lower the amount of ice, um, we lower our re reflectivity, and we increase absorption. So when we're talking about that incoming solar radiation, how it gets absorbed at the surface, if you darken the surface of the Earth, you're going to get more absorption. So here, this is an example of a positive feedback loop. So we have ice loss causing a darker surface means more radiation absorbed, which gives us higher temperatures. And if I have higher temperatures, I'm going to get more ice loss. And you can see how that's going to impact by reinforcing this circle that we have here. And so we can see kind of what that looks like in this image on the left and on the right from 1913 to 2012. This is in the same location, same time of year, but you can see how that glacier changed the albedo of the land. Um, the thing to keep in mind with positive feedback loops is it's not the same as heating and cooling. So here's the same positive feedback loop, but I just switched the words. I made them all opposite. So if we gain ice, we have a lighter surface or a higher albedo, we get more radiation reflected and lower temperatures. So ice and albedo, no matter how we frame it, is a positive feedback loop. The one on the right will actually lower temperatures. The loop on the left will actually increase temperatures. But both are positive feedback loops. So don't let yourself be tricked into thinking that one means warmer temperatures and the other means colder temperatures. That's not how it works. It's whether or not it reinforces itself. Um, so a negative feedback example would be like this one. Um, so here, and this is a very temporary um, example. Uh, we gave the one of the thermostat in your house. But if we have a higher temperature, we have a higher capacity for water. I'll talk about higher capacity here in just a second. Um, so you have more clouds, which that will then change Earth's albedo, also block a little bit of that sun, and will lower the temperature. So a negative feedback won't circle back around. See how I have a higher temperature here and a lower temperature here? So because I have two opposites, that's a negative feedback. Um, so keep that in mind. When we're talking about feedbacks, we're talking about whether or not it reinforces itself or not. Um, so what's that capacity piece? Well, before we learned about molecular kinetic theory, we learned about how when molecules move faster and spread out more, um, when they have more heat energy, um, when they move farther and spread out more, there's more space between them um, to fit other things. And so capacity you are, are probably already familiar with. Um, it's how much something can hold, like a 20-ounce pop bottle or a 6-ounce coffee cup so, so and whatnot. Air, if it's warmer, has a bigger capacity. So if you're using your note sheet, um, you would label that big glass warm and that small glass cold. Um, but air has a capacity for greenhouse gases. And so the warmer the air, the bigger the capacity for those greenhouse gases. And so if we have warmer air, we get more evaporation and more water vapor in the air. If we have more warmer air, we get more tundra thaws. We get more methane from bacteria. If we have warmer air, we can have more carbon dioxide. So this is a positive feedback loop, um, which is important when we're talking about um, when we're talking about these other, oops, I got to see where my windows are here. Um, so this first one, um, this one, what we can see here is we've got an animation, and it'll show you how uh, carbon dioxide is kind of on this left-hand side, global temperatures kind of up on the right-hand side. So as temperature goes up, our carbon dioxide goes up, and what's super important is this little steep bit. So we can see how it kind of goes up and down, up and down over time, but all of a sudden we have this big jump. 
that's a little bit problematic. I'm just going to let it play one more time. All right. So here on this one, what we see here, this one, let's see if I can get, um, this is atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. This is by um, pixel movers and shakers. And what we can see here is from pre-industrial to current times, 2017, it's a little old, um, carbon dioxide just increases over time, right? Um, so which brings me to this last one. Make sure you guys can see what I need you to see. Um, so here what we have, whoops, let's restart. Um, here we have a 100 by 100 piece cube, and so on this one, what we see is um, if we have 100 parts per million, because that's a, a million part of pixels per that cube, uh, that's 180 parts per million, which is where we would have been at the carbon dioxide at the last ice age, and 285, which is starts the Industrial Revolution. So now, if we add temperature, um, and so you'll see temperature on the left, Oh, I guess that's carbon dioxide on the left. And you'll see the yellow pixels start to show up. So as global temperature um, increases, and this is kind of our increase in carbon dioxide over time, what we see is we see this big jump starting about now in the 1970s. And you'll notice the change in the steepness of the line. And that's because of the positive feedback loop, right? As we change the temperature, we change that... Um, we change that feedback and um, we start to amplify that impact of that increased capacity. So we see just that drastic change in the slope of the line. And that's one of the things that really makes us um, kind of concerned as, um, as scientists and um, as citizens is because of that change. Um, here's another example of that same change. We see this temperature line in the middle You'll also notice there's a carbon dioxide line, which is this blue one, and the methane one, which is this other one, this red line. And um, so when we look at this graph, what I want you to notice is we kind of have these are in lockstep, right? So if we see um, the temperature go up, we see the carbon dioxide go up, we see the methane go up. Um, and when one, the other, when the other goes down, so does the other one. Um, and so we can kind of see how that temperature and capacity are related, right? And this goes back 800 thousand years. So we're talking a much longer time frame. And notice how all of these, they're kind of the same scale. They're all about the same height. They're going at the same rate, whatever. And now we get to now. So if we take this down to zero years present, notice how our carbon dioxide graph, we would have to rescale the entire graph to fit this last little chunk. And nowhere does it ever go higher than 300 parts per million. And in 2018, we hit 411. I think we're at 413 now. Um, so you'll have to look up current levels. Um, but notice how that whole scale of that graph changes. And so that feedback loop gets really important because it will magnify the impacts of those, um, of those relationships. Another feedback we want you to know about is biodiversity. Um, so one of the questions we were talking about was how... Um, how oop, that bell is in the video, not in your real life. Um, when we talk about biodiversity, uh, how many organisms are in a place? And so, as we start to, we when we started the unit, we were asking questions, and one of the things we were asking about was polar bears, right? And so, cooler climates at higher altitudes or higher latitudes, remember, um, where do they go? Right, so if it, it's warm where I live, and I can go north, or I can go up a mountain, I can get to someplace cooler. But what happens if I'm already at the top? Um, so we're going to see an increase of invasive species. So that little inset image, what you see there is some cedar trees in Nebraska. Those are an invasive species. They're not supposed to be in our grasslands and on our prairies and in our ranch lands. And so those are one that we have to be pretty. Uh, we can be pretty aggressive at trying to control. Um, we're not going to make them go extinct, but they are an invasive species in our in our state. Um, our current rate of change is about three degrees Celsius. So that's why Mount Pinatubo is a big deal because that's a half a degree is a lot. Um, that um, compare is very comparative to our last global warming event that was natural, and in that global warming event we saw a 92% species loss. 92%. So when we're talking about that um, 92%, are humans going to be 92 or are they going to be 8? We're going to be 8. We have brains. Um, but uh, what's the impact on our lives when we're talking about that other 92? 
Another example we have for biodiversity are, are corals. So one of the questions we asked was about coral bleaching. Um, so turf algae is the first thing to come back. So we can see that kind of green slimy stuff there. And then the herbivore fish, these like brightly colored little friendly guys, come and eat that um, eat that turf algae. And then they do their, you know, thing. They poop. Um, and that increases the food for other things like corals. So they should be able to come back. But these lionfish are an invasive species that come in and kill these guys off, which means nobody's there to eat the turf algae, and therefore the coral can't come back. Um, another example we have there is ocean acidification. Um, carbon dioxide uh, dissolving in the ocean creates the ocean acidification, and so while they need carbon dioxide, um, it still makes it so that they can't recover. Um, and so... Um, there's lots of different impacts of that biodiversity in terms of creating other events that happen because of a forcing or a feedback. Um, there is another example. This one's going to be linked at the end of this video. It's uh, one by Sustainable Man, and it's about how wolves can change rivers. Um, so it's going to be one trophic cascades um, are how we, you know, what are the ripples we don't see as human beings? What are the things that we could make happen that we don't anticipate? Um, so trophic cascades are this idea that uh, a change in one species can create multiple others. So in this video, you're going to see how um, humans had eradicated wolves out of Yellowstone. Um, they're going to reintroduce wolves, and it changes literally everything down to how the rivers flow. Um, so it's another example of feedbacks and how one small change can make a difference. Okay, warrior, so go check that video out and let your instructor know if you have any questions. Thank you.